Hello, everyone, and welcome to Exploring Space, part of our virtual planetarium programming, which is also part of our MOS at Home programming. My name is Janine, my pronouns are she and her, and I'll be your moderator today. That means I'll be reading some of your questions and responses, which you can submit below using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen here in the Zoom meeting. If you'd like to see captions during today's program, you can click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show subtitles. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, thank you so much for joining us, but unfortunately I'm unable to see your comments at this time. We are so delighted to have all of you here today as our audience. Let's meet our guides for this journey through space. Hi everybody, my name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, uh, and I will be your guide today as we talk about space, but I can't do it alone. Hello everybody, my name is Talia. I also use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be your pilot today as we fly to a few places out in space. Sounds good. So I thought that today um, the topic would be around human spaceflight. So what is going on right now in the world of human spaceflight? Um, what are we preparing for in the next coming years? And what is planned or hoping to be planned for the end of the decade um, and moving into the kind of 2030s, early 2030s. Um, so right now, Talia has us in orbit around the Earth, and you can see lots of labels and lines around the Earth. Um, those are indicating satellites. And this is kind of where we're going to start. Um, so the first place that I want to go to today is the largest human-made structure in space. So if anybody knows what structure that I'm talking about, go ahead and type it into the Q&A. And by the way, throughout the program, if you have any questions or need clarification on anything I'm talking about, please feel free to type it in there. I will also try to pause for questions and definitely leave some time at the end for questions as well. It looks like we have a couple people saying ISS or space station. Yeah, exactly. I'm talking about the International Space Station. So Talia, bring us up to the ISS for short. So like I said, this is the largest human made structure in space. And if you go from one side to the other, from the solar panels to solar panels, that's about uh, the length of a football field. It's actually, I think, one foot shy of the exact length of an entire football field. And so all those rectangles you see on the left and right there are the solar panels. That's how the space station is powered. And then that central region there is where the astronauts are located. So there's a couple of different segments um, and I'll talk about those in just a second. But first I wanna talk about where the ISS is located. So you can see we're actually not that far away from earth. And that's because the ISS is located in low earth orbit which means it's very close by. Um, if you were to measure from the surface straight up to the ISS, that's about 250 miles. Um, so if you could drive a car straight up, it would just take a few hours, but that's not how they get uh, astronauts onto the ISS. And it also orbits very quickly. So it only takes 90 minutes for the ISS to orbit the Earth one time. So that means it orbits 15 and a half times every day. That is a lot of sunrises and sunsets. And I will interrupt to note that uh, this simulation is running in real time. So if you notice the background of the I of behind the ISS getting darker, it's because that is where the ISS is right now. It's heading into night and it is moving in real time in this simulation. That's a great thing to point out. Um, this is this program is called NASA's Eyes, and it's a free program that you can download. So if you wanted to track the ISS, this is a, a cool way to do it, as Talia mentioned. Um, also, there's a website called Spot the ISS. So if you ever want to see it flying above your area, um, you can go to that website. I forget the entire. It's called Spot the ISS, um, like dot NASA or something like that. Um, I'm sure if you type it into Google, it'll be the first thing that comes up. Um, but then you can input your location and it will tell you the next time that you'll be able to see the ISS flying overhead. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Was there a question? 
There is a question. The question is, does it orbit in the same direction as the Earth turns? Yeah, great question. Um, it does. So as viewed from the top, the Earth spins counterclockwise. And so the ISS is also spinning in that direction or orbiting in that direction. And because it's so close to the Earth, it has to move very quickly. Otherwise, it would just fall back to the surface, right, because of the Earth's gravity. So it is moving at about 17,000 miles an hour uh, in its orbit. And essentially, when we talk about um, astronauts in space, we tend to think of them as weightless, um, you know, not experiencing any gravity, but there actually is quite a bit of gravity because they're so close to the Earth. It's just that they're in a state of perpetual free fall. Um, so essentially what's happening is that they're just falling to the Earth, but since they're moving so quickly, they never actually hit the surface. The Earth kind of curves away. And that's really what it means to be in orbit around an object is that you're just in perpetual free fall, but never actually hitting the surface of whatever object that is, whether it's you know the Earth with satellites or the moon or the sun or any of the planets and their moons. Um, it's basically a, a perpetual free fall. So astronauts on board the ISS are in this state of perpetual free fall, which we call microgravity. And that's why we see them experiencing, um, you know, like they're floating and their hair is all over the place and, um, you know, various objects that they bring up with them um, float around. And so this environment is really important for uh, studying how humans react to being in space for a long time. And so a lot of what's going on on the ISS right now is to research um, how humans react to the microgravity environment in long-term space flights, which eventually will be really useful for uh, sending humans back to the moon and eventually sending humans to Mars. Um, so I do want to talk more about that in just a second, but I want to pause and see if there have been any questions so far. Any more questions? We have a question from Henry, who is age seven. How many people fit on the ISS? A great question. Um, so the ISS is meant to have six people on it. That's kind of its max capacity. It does go over that sometimes, and sometimes there's not quite six people. Like right now, there are seven people on the ISS. Um, and they're not all from the US. They're not all NASA astronauts, because as the name suggests, this is an international uh, space station. And so half of it is there are kind of two segments. There's the Russian orbital segment or the Roscosmos orbital segment, which is um, the kind of spot that's opposite uh, of where we're looking right now. And then there is the US orbital segment, which is the part that we're looking at in the middle there. And that part is run by the United States, the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency. So um, together, those agencies plus the Russian Roscosmos um, are kind of part of the entire ISS. Um, and so right now there are several astronauts um, from Roscosmos and I believe three from NASA and one from the Japanese Space Agency. We have one other question, which is how do I, how do we I differentiate or identify a star from a satellite when we're observing the night sky? Yeah, another good question, because sometimes it's hard. Um, satellites do reflect light, especially the ISS. The ISS is very bright if it's if you've ever seen it um, overhead. And a good way to tell that it's a satellite versus a star is just the fact that it's moving. So satellites look more like planes in the sky. They just don't really blink at all. They just look like a point of light that's moving fairly quickly across the sky, whereas stars don't move when you're looking at them. So that's a pretty easy way to tell. All right, so um, now I want to talk a little bit more about some of this, some of the research that is going on on the ISS to prepare humans for longer flights in space. And so to do that, I want to share with you, um, I'm going to switch over to a couple of slides now. Um, hopefully everybody can see this. It should be a picture of the ISS. So this is an actual picture, um, whereas we were just looking at a program that had real data 
to, to show you where the ISS is. Uh, but this one is from the space shuttle uh, mission back in, I think this was 2010 or 2011. And what we're looking at right here, this is the US orbital segment, the part that's kind of closer to us. And on the right here uh, is actually the Canada arm. So that's, that's part of the Canadian Space Agency and one of their modules that actually takes um, it's a giant robotic arm that actually brings like payloads that we send up there. So supplies for the astronauts, um, you know, uh, uh, modules, other modules, things like that. Um, and it essentially kind of brings them in so the astronauts don't have to like make a spacewalk every time they need to go and uh, receive materials or supplies from the Earth. All right, so anyways, um, these two astronauts, uh, Mark and Scott Kelly are twins, as you can probably see here. And they were part of um, an experiment that NASA did fairly recently where Mark Kelly, they're both astronauts, but uh, Mark Kelly, the one on the left here, stayed on the earth while his brother, Scott Kelly, went into space for a year. And the purpose of this trip was to see how the human body reacts to being in microgravity for an entire year. And this will help with, you know, if we want to send humans to the moon and develop a, a, a lunar base camp, or if we're going to send humans to Mars, they're going to be gone for a lot longer than a year. So um, they basically used Mark Kelly as the control and Scott Kelly to see um, what changed. And there's a lot that happens to the human body after that long in space. Your bones kind of disintegrate, um, they get really weak, and so do your muscles. Your muscle tissue starts to um, it degenerate, essentially, and your eyesight can get worse as well because the fluids in your body and this microgravity environment get shifted around and so there's a lot of pressure put on your eyes and so it makes it hard to see. Um, there's a lot of radiation up in space as well because you're not as protected as you are on the surface of the earth by the earth's magnetic field or the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so there's a lot of things that need to be taken into account. And this experiment was really eye-opening and beneficial so that NASA can start working on how to remedy these um, challenges when humans are gonna be spending a long time in space. And so that brings us to the next project um, that I wanna talk about or the next step for humans in space. And that is with Project Artemis. So Project Artemis is NASA's current um, trip to space that is planned for humans. Um, and it's not just NASA, it's the US commercial partners as well. So like Boeing, um, Blue Origin, Northrop Grumman, SpaceX, you know, a bunch of other, of other private partners and then international partners. So a lot of the same space agencies that we talked about with the ISS um, are gonna be working on Project Artemis as well. And so the goal of Artemis is to get the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. So the last time that humans stepped foot on the moon was back in the 1970s with the Apollo mission. And in mythology, Apollo is the twin brother of Artemis, um, who is the, I believe, the goddess of the moon. Is that right, Tali? I'm bad with mythology. Yes, she's the goddess of the moon. Okay, thank you. Um, so they named this project uh, very appropriately, especially because we are finally going to see the first woman step foot on the moon, which is very exciting. Um, now, there are a lot of steps to this project. They're not just gonna send humans up immediately. Um, and 2024 is actually a pretty soon and it's quite an ambitious goal. And we'll see if any of the pandemic has an effect on um, when that happens, if it's gonna be delayed at all, we will find out. Um, but there are lots of steps to it. So I wanna talk about um, quickly the rocket that we're gonna use, which is super exciting because it is the largest and most powerful rocket in the world. 
It's called the Space Launch System, and it is designed to carry a pretty hefty payload, so, which is going to be necessary for sending people to the moon. We're going to have to bring a lot of stuff with them. Um, and right at the top here, you can see the Orion spacecraft. So that's going to be the capsule that actually carries the astronauts. The rest of what you're looking at is just the rocket that is filled with fuel because you need a lot of fuel to get things off of the Earth and out of orbit or into orbit. Um, so we've got the Orion capsule up here at the, at the top. And then right underneath, there's another small um, kind of storage area that's going to bring um, CubeSats, which are basically small satellites that are going to do lots of other kind of science experiments um, in orbit around the moon. And then the rest is lots and lots of fuel. So that's the rocket and the capsule. Um, this is a very overcomplicated diagram, but if we just look at the center here, um, we can see the actual flight path of Artemis 1. So there are three stages of Project Artemis. The first one, or Artemis 1, is going to be uncrewed. And so they're just going to send the Orion capsule to do a flyby of the moon. Then the second one is going to be crewed, but it will also just be a flyby. And then the third one is going to be the one where they bring humans to the surface. Um, now, I do want to talk a little bit about why they chose the landing spot that they did. And for that, let's go back into space. So Talia, if you want to take it away, we can pin your video again to, oh, well, let me stop sharing. There we go. All right, so um, we're going to leave the ISS behind and head to the moon. So this is a pretty big difference. The ISS is only 250 miles above the Earth, whereas the moon is uh, like 175,000 miles away. So you're much, much farther away than you would be on the ISS. And the landing spot for Artemis three is going to be the lunar south pole and the reason that they chose this spot is because there is a very massive crater um, at the south pole actually i think it's the it's the largest one on the moon is it the largest in no never mind it's amongst the largest of um, the solar stations in the solar system it's actually so big that you're, you're not going to be able to see it here it's not one of these clearly defined um impact sites if you're trying to figure out where it is it's actually very old and its edges are slightly eroded away which makes it harder to make out and it probably doesn't help that there are craters within craters <laughs> <laughs> so like this one massive crater probably has many many inside of it and uh in the south polar region there are some places that actually never see the sunlight because they are shadowed by the edges of craters and just the fact that the moon doesn't have a pretty significant tilt, um, they just stay shadowed for billions of years. And recent explorations of this part of the moon have shown that there is water ice in some of these shadowed regions. And so it makes it a great spot for humans to kind of set up camp because there could be resources like water that they could extract from um, from the crater, as well as other minerals. And they could also probably get a lot of information about the early solar system, because again, this spot has remained relatively unchanged for an incredibly long time. And so it'll probably tell us uh, a lot more about the Earth Moon system, how the moon formed. It should also tell us a lot about the sun's history as well, because again, it's remained unchanged so we can actually see patterns in the soil on on the moon of you know different varying um, solar activity over billions of years and so there's a lot that this specific area can tell scientists and it also helps that the edges of craters um, they can tend to be really high up and there's actually a mountain in this region as well that's one of the highest mountains in the solar system um, and those might be good sp spots to put solar panels to actually you know provide energy to humans that are 
around the moon or, you know, eventually maybe setting up camp on the moon. So that's kind of another step in this whole process is that after Artemis 3 or during Artemis 3, they want to, NASA and international partners want to set up a gateway, which is essentially an international space station around the moon. And this will kind of serve as a base camp for people going to the moon, astronauts going to the moon, or in the future, astronauts going to Mars. It's a place that can receive supplies. Um, it's a place where, uh, you know, different pieces of spacecraft can dock and, you know, take astronauts to and from the moon. It could be a place where things launch from. So if you're going to get to Mars, it's much easier to leave off the moon than it is to leave off of the Earth, just because the moon is a lot smaller and has less gravity. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why this lunar gateway and specifically the lunar South Pole are appealing for humans right now, for human spaceflight. So I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions. Well, we got some questions. Um, Christine is wondering what a payload is. Yeah, so a payload can be, um, it can be a lot of things. It can be people, it can be technology, like computers, um, it can just be supplies like food and water, um, anything that you might need in space. It's whatever is, you're trying to get to space. Yeah, exactly, is sent into space, exactly. We have a question from Quint who wonders if there could be microorganisms in the ice on the moon. Another great question. Um, there could be. Uh, I don't know. Tali, what do you think? So probably not because um, we don't think that the moon ever had conditions that where life could have formed in the first place. So uh, we don't think there would be any lunar microbes on the moon. One potential possibility, though, is that um, if something hit the Earth and um, knocked a piece of the earth into space and that piece of rock had earth microbes on it and that piece of rock landed on the moon and wound up embedded in the ice. That's a very long chain of what ifs, but uh, if we did find microbes on the moon, most likely they would have come from earth. Um, we're pretty sure there's probably been bits of earth that have wound up on the moon. We know there have been bits of the moon that have wound up on earth from impacts. So um, it makes sense it would go the other way. And if that bit of earth did have microbes on it, you know, I guess that would be possible. It's very unlikely, but- Astronauts gonna... could bring them too by accident. Astronauts are gonna bring their own microbes, yes. <laughs> Molly, who is 11, whose pronouns are they and them, um, wonders what happens to the fuel-filled part of the rocket after launch? A great question. So the uh, boosters that you saw on the side of the diagram, they get jettisoned back uh, into space and essentially fall to the Earth and burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, not all um, rocket stages burn up completely. Some of them are reusable, like you might have seen recent launches of um, the Falcon rockets, the Falcon 9, the Falcon Heavy. A lot of those SpaceX rockets are reusable. The SLS, I believe, is expendable, meaning that it will just be used up in one go. Is that right, Talia? I believe that is correct. Um, the development of SLS has had a very long and tortured history and when they started designing it, reusable rocket stages weren't really an idea yet. But the Orion capsule, so the part that's actually going to bring humans, is going to be partially reusable. So aspects of it will be reused. I think it, it's possible that the boosters, the side boosters, might be reusable. Reused as well. Um, that's what happened when, they, when we used to launch the space shuttle into space, the big orange huge gas tank that thing didn't come back that burned up in the atmosphere but the two white rockets on the side those would land in the ocean and get towed back to Florida and fixed up and reused again. Elena wants to know how long a day on the moon is actually that's Henry is asking. So it's kind of a weird thing to think about because we don't normally imagine the moon as spinning when we look up and we see the moon in the sky we are always seeing the same side of the moon 
and that's because it's tidally locked. Uh, so we're always seeing that one side from the surface of the Earth. But the moon does spin. It just spins once for every orbit that it makes. So um, one day on the moon or the amount of time it takes for it to spin one time is a month. Great. And then here's a relativity question that um, I, I don't remember <laughs> if it's fast or slow, but um, the person who is asking, the person is asking, um, people who are on the ISS are farther away from people on Earth. Um, so is time on the ISS slower on Earth? Um, and they say due to gravity, but I think this is a good opportunity to talk about special relativity. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually, um, that's an awesome point to bring up because when the twins, so we had Mark Kelly on the surface of the earth and Scott Kelly on the International Space Station for a year, when Scott Kelly got back because of special relativity and the fact that gravity messes with time a little bit, um, he was actually, I think it was one one hundred thousandth of a second younger than Mark Kelly who stayed on the surface of the earth. Um, one one hundred thousandth, I think was is how as the fraction of a second it might even be smaller than that um might have to double check fact check that one um but he did come back a teensy teensy tiny bit um younger which would mean that time on the iss would move just a teensy teensy bit slower right that sounds right to me yeah. <laughs> it's moving fast it does funny things and they're going around the earth real fast so I think that's all we have time for today. All right. Um, there is just one other thing I wanted to point out to wrap up with. Uh, fabulous questions. Um, I'm just going to share the PowerPoint one more time. Um, let's see. We'll move on from this. Uh, so this is just a, a slide about a potential lunar base that they that NASA and international partners would like to um, create by maybe the end of the decade, maybe the early 2030s, and the steps that kind of go with that. Um, but then, of course, this is all leading to you know when are we going to send humans to Mars? And there are some risks that go with sending humans to Mars that don't necessarily apply to sending humans to the ISS or humans to the moon. Um, and I just wanted to kind of briefly outline some of them and like, you know, the changing gravity. So weightlessness that they are experiencing. It's something that astronauts experience all the time when they're in space, um, but they'd be experiencing it for a much longer time. So going to Mars would take six to 10 months, um, which is a lot a lot longer than it does to take to the moon um, or the ISS. So dealing with that, the Martian gravity would be different coming back to Earth after years of being away from the Earth's gravity um, would take a toll. There's a lot going on inside of a small capsule when you have uh, humans inside a tiny contained space for a long time. I'm sure everyone can relate a little bit now because of the pandemic. Um, but even, you know, even more confined than that, you've got psychology at work and, and um, how microbes and microorganisms interact in microgravity. It's actually easier to get sick in space. You've got radiation exposure for a longer time and just the fact that you're so far away from Earth. And so these are some of the unique risks um, with sending humans to Mars, but they're not meant to be super scary because NASA is using the International Space Station and Project Artemis to work through how to mitigate these risks and to create new technology to ensure safe flights for humans to Mars, which will hopefully come in the next decade or two. Um, but I will stop there. So thank you all. Yes, thanks everybody for joining. Katie and Talia, thank you for being our excellent flight crew today. Thanks everyone. Um, I do wanna thank all of you so much for joining us today uh, for this virtual planetarium. Um, 
if you would like to see what other virtual programs we're offering, you can follow the museum on our social media channels or check out www.mos.org slash MOS at home. If you enjoyed today's presentation and would like to support more programming like this, please visit engage.mos.org slash welcome to support MOS at home. And today's program was produced, as Katie said, using the free software NASA's Eyes, which you can find at eyes.nasa.gov. Thank you everyone so much for participating. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to all of your very good questions, but we do hope you'll join us again soon.